NASA just killed Artemis. The presidential budget request was clear. Terminate SLS and Orion after Artemis III. Cancel Gateway completely. America's moon program? Dead. Then Congress did something shocking. While you were celebrating July 4th, they quietly threw $10 billion at a dying program. Not just saved it, rescued it completely. But here's what's crazy. That same week, the 400-foot launch tower for Artemis reached full height at Kennedy. A tower for rockets that were supposed to be canceled. Coincidence? How did a program marked for death suddenly get $4.1 billion in funding through 2032? What really happened behind closed doors? Let's dive right in. Let's start with what almost happened. The presidential budget request for 2026 wasn't just bad news. It was a complete execution order. NASA's Artemis program, which had already consumed $93 billion, was about to be chopped into pieces. The plan was brutal, terminate the space launch system and Orion spacecraft after Artemis III, cancel the Gateway Lunar Station entirely, and essentially abandon America's return to the moon. Think about that for a second. We're talking about a program that took 20 years to develop, involved thousands of engineers, and represented America's answer to China's growing space dominance. All of it, gone. But here's where it gets interesting. Someone in Congress clearly had other plans. While most Americans were focused on barbecues and fireworks, something extraordinary was happening in the halls of Congress. A bill was moving through the system. Not just any bill, what insiders called the Big Beautiful Bill, and buried deep inside its pages was the biggest space policy reversal in decades. This wasn't your typical budget discussion. This was a reconciliation bill, which means the money goes on top of whatever NASA eventually gets in the formal budget process. Translation? Congress was about to throw serious cash at a supposedly dead program. But why? What changed between the death sentence and the rescue? The answer lies in what was happening at Kennedy Space Center that exact same week. Picture this. While Congress was debating Artemis's fate, Contractor Bechtel was putting the finishing touches on Mobile Launcher 2. This isn't just any tower. It's a 400-foot engineering marvel designed specifically for the SLS Block 1B rocket. The same rocket that was supposed to be canceled. Module 10, the final piece of this massive puzzle, was being hoisted into place. Seven modules total, confusingly numbered 4 through 10. Why the weird numbering? because modules one, two, and three were scrapped during design changes. Already, this tower had survived one round of cuts. Here's the kicker. This tower costs hundreds of millions of dollars and serves exactly one purpose, launching the heavier, more advanced version of SLS, starting with Artemis IV. If Congress had let the program die, this tower would have become the most expensive piece of space junk in history. Was this timing coincidental? Or was someone sending a very clear message to Congress? The numbers that emerge from this bill are staggering. Of the nearly $10 billion allocated to NASA from 2025 to 2032, here's where the money went. $2.6 billion for Gateway, $4.1 billion for SLS launches through Artemis V, and funding secured all the way through 2029. But wait, there's more. The bill also included $20 million for Orion spacecraft operations, specifically mentioning future reuses. This might sound small, but it's huge. Orion capsules are designed to be reused, and this funding officially endorses that plan. Every reuse saves taxpayers hundreds of millions. The International Space Station got $1.25 billion, and SpaceX's ISS deorbit vehicle received $325 million. But the most interesting allocation? $1 billion for infrastructure improvements across NASA centers. This is where things get really interesting. Hidden in that infrastructure, money was an $85 million allocation for transport of a space vehicle to a NASA center. But not just any space vehicle. The language was incredibly precise. The vehicle had to meet exact criteria. Already flown to space, carried astronauts, and be transferred to a center involved in the commercial crew program. It had to be placed in public exhibition within the metropolitan area of that center. Sound familiar? 
This matches perfectly with a proposal from Texas Senators Ted Cruz and John Cornyn from April. They wanted to move Space Shuttle Discovery from the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. to Houston, home of Johnson Space Center and Mission Control. Their argument? Houston deserved one of the shuttle orbiters after the program ended. Was this entire rescue operation partially motivated by Texas politics? The timing certainly suggests it. Saving Artemis wasn't just about rockets and capsules. It triggered a cascade of technical decisions that will shape space exploration for decades. The exploration upper stage, which transforms SLS from a capable rocket into a powerhouse, was suddenly back on track. This upper stage is crucial. Without it, SLS Block 1B can't deliver the heavy payloads needed for sustainable lunar operations. With it, each mission can carry both crew and significant cargo to the moon. The difference between building a lunar outpost and just visiting occasionally. Mobile Launcher 2 wasn't just saved, it became essential. The original mobile launcher can only handle the smaller SLS Block 1. For the bigger, more powerful Block 1B, you need a taller, stronger tower. That's exactly what Model 10 completion represents. But here's where the story takes an unexpected turn. While Congress was saving traditional rockets, the space industry was already moving toward reusability. The bill includes provisions for SpaceX's ISS deorbit vehicle, acknowledging that commercial space has become indispensable. Meanwhile, Europe is racing toward reusability with their Themis demonstrator. This 28-meter tall rocket uses a single Prometheus engine and is designed to land vertically like SpaceX's Falcon 9. After traveling 3,000 kilometers across five countries, it's now at Sweden's Etzrange Space Center, preparing for its first hop test. The contrast is striking. While America debates funding traditional rockets, Europe is testing reusable technology that could dramatically reduce costs. The Prometheus engine alone costs one-tenth of current European rocket engines through extensive 3D printing. The bill didn't just save lunar missions. It threw $700 million at a Mars telecommunications orbiter, required to be delivered by 2028. This creates an interesting dynamic. While lunar exploration gets massive funding, Mars missions remain on the back burner. Meanwhile, private companies are proposing dramatically cheaper alternatives. Lockheed Martin's new Mars sample return proposal promises to do the job for under $3 billion less than a third of the original $11 billion estimate. Their secret? Leveraging existing spacecraft heritage and smaller, lighter vehicles. Rocket Lab has gone even further, proposing a complete end-to-end -end solution for just $4 billion, returning samples as early as 2031. SpaceX suggested using Starship's massive capacity to simplify the entire mission architecture. This creates a fascinating paradox. Congress just spent $10 billion to save a traditional space program, while private companies are demonstrating that the same goals might be achievable for a fraction of the cost. Is this about national capability, or is it about protecting jobs and infrastructure? The answer might lie in what happened to NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. After 20 years in orbit, engineers figured out how to make it perform 120-degree roll maneuvers four times its original design limit. These new moves allow its radar to peer deeper into Mars's subsurface with 10 times stronger signals. Sometimes innovation comes from pushing existing hardware beyond its limits. Maybe that's what Congress is betting on with Artemis. While America debates its lunar strategy, other nations are making moves. Japan's H-2A rocket family just completed its final mission after 30 years of service. 50 launches with only one failure an impressive record by any measure. China continues its steady progress with classified satellite launches. Their space station Tiangong now regularly hosts crews, creating a permanent human presence in orbit. The message is clear. America's space leadership isn't guaranteed. The Interstellar Visitor 3i slash ATLAS, hurtling through our solar system at record speeds, serves as a reminder that the universe doesn't wait for budget decisions. This 20-kilometer object will reach its closest approach to the sun in October, potentially setting speed records for natural objects in our solar system. Behind all the political maneuvering, real technology validation is happening. Lockheed Martin recently tested Orion's automated docking systems using drones in California 
and simulation centers in Denver. These systems will be crucial for Lunar Gateway operations. The tests prove that Orion can identify and dock with other spacecraft from over a kilometer away down to zero distance. This capability will be essential for the complex orbital choreography required for lunar missions. Artemis II will test laser communications from deep space, technology that's 10 to 100 times faster than traditional radio. Using commercial off-the-shelf parts, NASA has developed a system that could revolutionize deep space communications at a fraction of traditional costs. The bill's passage has created some unexpected consequences. Private space companies now face new launch and re-entry licensing fees based on payload mass. Spaceports get fiscal exemptions, but operators pay more for larger payloads. This creates interesting market dynamics. Small satellite operators benefit from the exemptions, while large payload missions face higher costs. It's almost as if Congress is trying to level the playing field between traditional aerospace and the new space economy. But perhaps the most unexpected consequence is what's happening at the International Space Station. With $1.25 billion in additional funding, the station's life could be extended beyond its planned 2030 retirement. This buys time for commercial space stations to mature while maintaining continuous human presence in orbit. So what's really at stake here? It's not just about rockets and budgets. It's about America's position in the new space race. China is building lunar bases, Europe is developing reusable rockets, and private companies are proving that space access can be affordable. The $10 billion question isn't whether Artemis was worth saving. It's whether traditional approaches can compete with innovative alternatives. Congress made a bet that established infrastructure and proven technology are worth preserving, even at premium prices. But here's the twist that nobody saw coming. By saving Artemis, Congress might have accidentally created the perfect testing ground for validating new technologies against traditional approaches. Artemis missions will now run parallel to commercial lunar initiatives, creating a real-time comparison of methodologies. The tower that shouldn't exist, Mobile Launcher 2, now stands as a symbol of this complex decision. It represents both the enormous costs of traditional space programs and the irreversible momentum they create once construction begins. As we look ahead, two very different space futures are emerging. One built on government-funded, traditional approaches with massive infrastructure and proven reliability. The other based on commercial innovation, reusable technology, and dramatically lower costs. The collision between these approaches is already happening. NASA's Artemis missions will launch alongside SpaceX's Starship development. European reusable rockets will compete with American traditional systems. Chinese lunar bases will be built while American astronauts are still figuring out how to sustain lunar operations. The question is no longer whether America will return to the moon. The question is whether the approach Congress just funded will be competitive with the alternatives that are emerging. The answer to that question will reshape not just space exploration, but America's role in the cosmos for decades to come. The rescue of Artemis might have been the easy part. The real challenge starts now. So here we are. Congress just dropped $10 billion on a program that was supposed to die. Meanwhile, that 400-foot tower stands tall at Kennedy, almost like it knew something we didn't. The real story isn't about saving Artemis. It's about what happens when old-school space meets the new guard. We're about to witness the ultimate showdown. Traditional rockets versus reusable innovation. Government funding versus commercial efficiency. But here's what keeps me up at night. While we're debating budgets and towers, China's building lunar bases, Europe's testing reusable rockets, and private companies are proving they can do more for less. The rescue might be complete, but the race? That's just getting started. What do you think? Did Congress make the right call, or should they have let innovation lead the way? Drop your thoughts below, because this conversation is far from over. And hey, if you're as obsessed with space politics as I am, hit that subscribe button. Because trust me, this is just the beginning of a very wild ride. The cosmos is watching. The question is, are we ready to answer? Why can't anyone copy SpaceX's Raptor engine? NASA tried for decades, gave up. Russia built theirs, but it never flew. 
Only SpaceX cracked the code that destroys engines before they even work. Here's what makes it impossible. 800 bar pressure that melts steel, custom metals that don't exist anywhere else, and a fuel cycle so complex that dozens of engines literally melted during testing. But the real secret, it's not just the technology, it's something much deeper. Let's dive right in. So here's the real story behind SpaceX's impossible engine. It starts with failure. Spectacular, expensive failure. Back in 2002, SpaceX built their first rocket engine, the Merlin 1A. It was, honestly, pretty terrible. Just 340 kilonewtons of thrust. And on its very first flight,